Right, we've now got uh, two rebuttals. This will be for 15 minutes each, and then you'll be relieved to know we have a break. So, firstly, people on my right, and then 15 minutes, and then after that, uh, people on my left. Thank you. Well, uh, obviously, when someone brings up in 30 minutes a whole bunch of points, there's not, you, can't, you need to take, it's easy to say, all right, let's say with the women are in Islam, that just takes a few seconds to explain it, and that's not the case, it takes minutes. So I'm going to answer as quickly as I can all those points, as best as I can. Uh, we're glad you like uh, our Islam, but it's called classical Islam. You try to try this game sometime. Um, the bill said that he came from this background, you know, I think the same background as Libyan Jihad. As a Kalyani, you believe in Jihad the pen. In fact, that's one of the main differences between Islam and Kalyanism, is that they don't believe in the U.S. military at the same time. Yeah, no, that's, 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 that's a shame. Anyway, um, so the uh, other point, how much violence did they commit in the name of Islam in, in, in the past week? How, how many, how many, how many people have Christians killed in the past week in Afghanistan, Pakistan, around Iraq, and so on? How many? And you might say, they're not practicing Christians. Well, then allow us to retort with the same response. Right. Um, when it comes to, they said, uh, they said that, oh, you know, how Muslims, we're not, we're not peaceful because look at these verses, they say that we go to attack and so on. I said, as individuals, we are peaceful, we can't. Much like Christian, much like the Christian theology, as individuals you have to be peaceful. But if the ruler gives you a marching orders, you have to go. Unlike Christianity, we can say no if the ruler says it's an unjust war. But Christian scholars are still divided this very day as to whether you have to still obey the ruler, even if he commands you to do injustice and to attack other countries and so on. And I can bring Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, Calvin, and uh, Martin Luther to bear on this one. And unless they you know nothing about Islam, those four guys, Enough about Christianity, rather. They're not about Christianity, then, then, then fine, but uh, they seem to be quite good authorities in your religion. So I've heard. Anyway, as for abrogation, Surah 929, where it says, fight, uh, fight those who disbelieve on the last day, nor hold what Allah has held forbidden. But interesting enough, they, they pass along that, nor hold forbidden what Allah has held forbidden. You know, one of the conditions of peace between uh, uh, the, the Prophet Muhammad and the, the Najrani tribe was that they don't do interest, they don't use interest. They don't use interest banking or whatever, which is an oppressive, it's an it's a unjust system. And it has been prohibited, interest prohibited. And remember I said in the verse, Allah has declared war, and this message has declared war on those people who, have, who, who do interest, who practice interest. Now, for all our benefit, for all our, our sake, because it's an unjust system. So, those who do not hold what Allah has held forbidden, and if you read all the verses, if you read verses before that, and all the verses where it said, those who move out of than what God has revealed, they are the oppressors. You see? So it's all in context. Oppressors, it is oppression. If you will, with, with other than what we call capitalism, communism, it's oppressive systems. Communism is oppressive, and we call that other than what God has revealed. God is a problem with that. And Christianity, uh, with the Christians that were practicing in those times, there was no Christian law. There is no Christian law today being applied anywhere. So again, you, you still fall short of following the own revelation God gave you. You have to implement it. But anyway. Um, so abrogation, there's no abrogation on this one, it's addition, as in another verse comes down and it adds to it because all the other verses Muslims still use, there's still historical documents, we all use it, the prophets still use it, the companions still use it, these other verses which talk about the fans, which talk about um, uh, offense, they all used it, they still use it, there was no abrogation. Where did they get this idea from? I don't know. Source of conflict, you know, source of conflict was Muhammad's criticism, really? That's like saying that to, 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 to the Christians, essentially, that the source of conflict was Jesus in, in Israel. Damn it! He got crucified for his own fault because he criticized the Pharisees. Bad Jesus. No. I believe what Jesus did, and what Prophet did, what Prophet Muhammad Islam did, is righteous and just. So if you're going to condemn the Prophet Muhammad for this, you're going to condemn Jesus as well. Sorry. As for the, the, the issue of the, uh, someone being killed with jawbone of a camel, sounds like something in the Old Testament. I haven't heard of that in Islam. You were the source for that, David. Yeah, yeah. Which one? Uh, the jawbone of a camel. It sounds a bit like Samson in the Old Testament to me. Yeah. Anyway, uh, as for. Oh, sorry. Oh, 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 yeah. um, as for Hamza hitting someone with a girl, this was before Hamza became Muslim, and he saw someone abusing the Prophet Muhammad, and he hit someone, saying, Well, yeah, it's not a coward for, essentially. That was before he became Muslim, so we're held to account for those who are Muslim yet. Right, fine. <laughs> prophecy, he said, oh, the, the Prophet Muhammad prophesied they conquered the Persians and Romans. Well, doesn't this sound like a prophet, really? <laughs> yeah, actually, what happened? I think, are you arguing against or for Islam? I don't know. I mean, do you say that Prophet Muhammad was, 
was successful in one of the prophet, prophecies he gave, that they will come when there was only five Muslims in the whole world, that he prophesied that the Muslims will conquer the Romans and Persians who were a mighty empire at that time. I think that's a sign of his prophethood, not, not a sign that, that refutes him, but thanks for bringing it up. As for, he preached 10 years and survived. Wow. Ten years, well, yeah, he, he preached 10 years and survived. You know, interesting thing is this here, yeah? what kind of society was it? Was it like a society where, you know, you had centralized government and you had obviously a police force and so on? Was that the kind of society it was? These people were very anachronistic. It was a tribal society. Abu Talib's tribe was protecting Prophet Muhammad. If anyone killed Prophet Muhammad, there would be a blood feud that would kill loads of people and they were scared of this. Until they came up, they had a plan that if we, all the other tribes were paid, if we all do it together at the same time, they can't, if the Abu Talib's tribe can't attack us. So we can all get away with it. When they came up with that plan, they decided to strike the Prophet Muhammad, but he had left by that time. Why does the middle not know this? Very interesting. Curious. Anyway. Then he said that the Prophet Muhammad declared to Quraysh, I bring you slaughter, according to the uh, Hadith uh, scholars of uh, classical and modern. It's fabricated, uh, so they should know this. If you check your research, or, or, or I can bring up the Gospel Barnabas if you want. <laughs> and so that's authentic as well, yeah? Right. Uh, they said two, kill, two people were killed in 10 years. Well, the Quran says, like and my, my Jewish friend also agree, also in his sources, if you kill one person, it's as if you kill all humanity. So I'm sorry, that's not acceptable. Only two people die. It's okay. It's only human beings. You can kill them, isn't it? No. Um, caravan raiding. Interesting thing about caravan raiding. The, the caravan that was raided, the, the Croatian caravan, what was on that caravan? What was on the caravan? On the caravan of the Croatian, that, that was Muslims raided this caravan. Yeah, what was it? It was the properties that were stolen from the Muslims, the people that still remained behind, it was stolen from the Muslims and, and put on that caravan, they were brutalized, all their positions taken, put on that caravan to make money for the people that had taken it from them. What, is it wrong to take it back? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, right, uh, as for, and as they said that the Prophet Muhammad started the war with Quraysh, according to uh, Sultan Nabi book uh, by Alan Shimi and Mani. It said that uh, the cause that led to the Battle of Badr, all battles fought between the Prophet Muhammad and the infidels of Arabia, was as stated by Urwa bin Zubair, the death of Amr Khedam, who was slain, who was killed by Croatia, Croatia, who Wakil bin Abdullah Tamimi. Do some research. I'm going to give you this book back here. Yeah, I'll tell you that you have to be in love with this book, or all the books like it afterwards. So, some, some research, please. <coughs> Sorry? Yes, she owns it. Yes, she owns that book. Yeah. And there's no excuse then. Well, I use it. <laughs> right. Um, he said, fight those who do not disbelieve. They kept bringing up, fight those who do not disbelieve. That's what he says, fight those who do not disbelieve. Right. Yes, fine. Okay. As Muslims, obviously, we're not going to, uh, uh, we're, we're in terms of spreading Islam. Let's say if you're a communist, right, there's no point in invading the Soviet Union, is it? Because all the communists are there. It's like, uh, we must invade all the communists to spread communism. Not going to work. Yeah, or, or America said, we must invade them, all the democracies to control. On the battle. Anyway, but, uh, <laughs> Everyone knows about South America. Anyway, long story. But, but, um, it, it doesn't make sense. Obviously, the Quran's going to say Muslims are going to fight against those who don't believe in Islam and are not implementing this, uh, the, 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 the law system, a just law system. So, of course, we're going to fight. Uh, but they said, oh, but it's because of belief. We're fighting because of belief. If that was the case, we would force them to be Muslim. But they never were forced to be Muslim. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the fact that there are Egyptian Christians, Coptics, uh, a Syrian church, there, there's a few Jews. There are so many denominations uh, uh, in, in the Middle East to this very day with the oldest churches in the world. What, did the Muslims just forget? Just like when they pass by the church, it goes, hmm, that's a funny mosque. <laughs> Sorry, it doesn't make sense, no. Uh, we only show friendship outwardly and we, uh, and we pretend to be peaceful. This is very interesting, they, they say this. We should, you know, because... The, the verse of the Quran which says, you know, um, do not be, do not be, do not take the, the Jews and Christians as your allies and protectors. It means, do not, yeah, do not take them as your patrons. If you're going to establish an Islamic system, uh, a Sharia, you're not going to have a Christian who's ruling it because he doesn't believe in it. It's like having, you know, have a communist system and have a capitalist ruling it. It doesn't make sense because he doesn't believe in it. Why are you going to make him a ruler? Why are you going to make the, 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 the capitalist or the communist protectors of each other when they don't, they have a different ideology? They, they don't agree with each other. Why should they? This is why we said, the Christians are, and Muslims and, Jew, and Jews are left alone, they're, they're left alone. Autonomy, they can have their own laws if they want, and they do. Sometimes they went to the Sharia calls better laws. And, and, and that's it. We don't expect them to be under our system. But very interestingly enough, though, it's very interesting, very interesting in 2 Corinthians 6.14, I can say the same about Christians. It says, 
Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial, the uh, pagan god? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the, the temple of the living God, and as God said, I, I, I will live with them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the, says the Lord. Touch not unclean things, I will receive you. I will be, I will be the father of you, and so on and so forth. So, this, so I could say that the Christians do can't be friends with Muslims or any non-Christian. And so on. And yes, people shake their heads. But also, Muslims are shaking their heads when they're trying to uh, twist our sources. So at least you have to un- try to understand this. Try to understand this. Our frustration when they try to misquote us. Yeah. Um, as for it says, oh, Jihad's given praise. Yes, martyrdom is given praise. So sacrificing the life of God is given praise. And it's sacrificing your life for God. Yeah, how many of you would actually have the, the, the brave, bravery to sacrifice your life for God? Ask yourself this question. Ask yourself this question before you push other people. I said, do not find, do not uh, find a spin in, in the brother's eye. You will see the, the, the log in yours. Yeah. Um, as for atheism, say what? Well, well, about theology or about the, the, the belief, atheism is more simplest. Yeah, but I also said it has to be consistent. An atheist is a contradiction because they can't answer which cause. A, the finite, limited, and contingent universe which we live in. The universe has to be as a cause. And if they don't, they don't answer this question, so their theology or their lack of is inconsistent and irrational. That's my point. In Islam, believe in one God, He creates everything, He's indivisible, infinite. What's wrong with that? Any contentions? I, I'm going to take contention. On Saturday evening, we're going to have this, this, this debate as well, so please, please be there. It'll be very interesting. He also says state of abasement. The, uh, the people were in a state of uh, the dhimmis are in a state of abasement, and he quoted uh, Ibn Abbas. Now, sorry, yeah. Now it is known that the, the, the person who quoted from Ibn Abbas, Tanwir al Mirbas, is almost unanimously known not to be from Ibn Abbas. Yes, Tafsir ascribed to him, and it's a fake one. So again, check your sources, please. Um, but let's say, what did the Prophet Muhammad? What did he really say, according to the hadiths from the Sami Sitta, the seven hadith books, the collections of hadith and so on? Prophet Muhammad said, whoever has harmed the dhimmi has harmed me. How much do we love the Prophet Muhammad? We will never tolerate a non-Muslim citizen of, of, this, of this, an Islamic state being harmed. Prophet Muhammad come said, uh, when he saw some dhimmis were, were, were being forced to pay jizya and they didn't have anything, he said, so the people doing it stopped and stopped doing it. He said, do not torture the people, for whoever tortures them in this world, Allah will, be, Allah will, will punish them, or will, 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 they'll be punished by Allah on their judgment. The Prophet also said, whoever oppresses a part of a person on the covenant, a dhimmi, a protected person, or oppresses him, or imposes on him something more than he can afford, or humiliates him, or takes anything from him without his consent, I will oppose him on the day of judgment. And as al Qarafi, the classical Muslim scholar, uh, uh, Malik scholar said, and this is agreed by all schools. Gentleness towards the weak, uh, towards, sorry, towards the to deal with the dhimmis here, how we should act towards them, which be gentleness, show gentleness towards their weak, providing clothing for them and soft speech. This must be done with affection and mercy, not intimidation or degradation. Furthermore, tolerating the fact that they must be bothersome neighbors whom you could force to move, but you do not do so out of kindness towards them, not out of fear or financial reasons. Also, praying that they receive guidance and thus join the ranks of the, of the Muslims, advising them in all the world in spiritual matters, protecting their reputation if they are exposed to slander, defending their property, family, rights, concerns, assisting them against oppression, and getting them their rights. These are all the obligations Muslims have to non Muslim citizens. It's, it's more than people do here, it's more than people do in this country. Well, yeah. Right. Thank you, thank you. Now, he mentioned apostasy and wife beating. I can't get to that because it's limited time. Well, suffice to say, apostasy is also a law in the Old Testament. If you condemn that, I want you to condemn the spirit that tells people to kill people for apostasy. I want you to condemn this. If you condemn this, I accept it. If you don't, sorry? Yeah, I want you to condone it, in fact. Condone it. Condone this thing that this thing has come from God. At one, as maybe not Islam, but at some point in your testament, we know this. As for wife beating, the, the, the verse, the hadith does not say that Aisha was beat, uh, beat by her husband. Uh, the Dalabar implies attack. In this, in this, it's not even Dalabar, I'm oh, sorry. It's not even Dalabar, it implies tap. The word that she used was, she was tapped. And it was, oh, it means she was struck down. This is silly. Please. 
this, this is silly, and please research the Arabic and the sources before you try to find any nitty gritty thing you can, because some people are so desperate to attack Islam, they try to find anything. So please check the sources, otherwise, you're only going to humiliate yourself when you bring up a debate like this. Yeah, and please source everything you say about the Prophet Muhammad in future. I think I'll answer all their, all their points as quickly as I can. I'm really sorry, people, that I can't um, deal with the rest of the stuff, but maybe my next, my next segment will deal with it. Thank you. Okay, we, we now invite our American friends to give their 15-minute rebuttal, after which time there will be a 15-minute break. Thank you. The next verse tells us clearly the reason why. The reason wasn't part of the modifiers. The modifiers is explaining who. The reason why is in the next verse, where it says, The Jews call Hosea the Son of God, and the Christians call Christ the Son of God. Allah's curse be on them. So the issue of why they're to be fought is explicit, because Allah's curse is on them, because they call certain people sons of God. It's for their beliefs. And, and no, notice something here. We didn't just quote Quran passages. There, that we're mis, we're uh, misrepresenting all these Quran passages. We quoted your greatest commentators who agree with us on these issues. And uh, actually, I, the reason why we have those beliefs is because the commentator said so in the first place. Before we move on, can I just briefly also mention his reference to uh, chapter 5, verse 32 of the Quran. He didn't actually mention the, the number of the verse, but the verse which says, if we kill one person, it says, if we killed everyone. That's chapter 5, verse 32 of the Quran, commonly used by Muslims to show that Islam is peaceful. However, if you read it in context, it says, We ordain for the children of Israel that if anyone slew a person, unless a leap or murder or for spreading mischief in the land, it would be as if he slew the whole people. So that's for the children of Israel. The next verse tells us how we're supposed to relate this to Muhammad and Allah. The next verse says, The punishment of those who wage war against Allah and his messenger and strive with might and name for mischief in the land is execution or crucifixion or the cutting off of hands and feet from opposite sides or exile from the land. Notice, the verse he's using to show you can't kill anyone is not applying to Muslims. The verse that does apply to Muslims says kill them, execute them if they provide mischief against Muhammad and wage war. And by the way, go to, uh, go to some Tafsir collections and look up what it means to be a mischief maker. It means to spread unbelief. 
uh, very dangerous ground, and this is what you'd be killed for. Now, uh, I, I hope I misinterpreted, I really, really hope that I misinterpreted what uh, Abdullah says. He says, yes, of course we fight people, we fight the oppressors. And then he described Western uh, uh, financial systems as oppressive systems. So does that mean he is called to fight the West? Uh, because of our oppressive systems and to end the oppression. I hope not, but I hope they'll clarify that for us. Um, he says he can point to violence in Christianity. Well, we will be dealing with this issue completely on, um, on Thursday. But notice what we, we weren't saying. We weren't saying, hey, look, uh, Muslims have committed violence in the world today, therefore Islam is violent. No. What did we say? We said uh, Islam. we have peaceful Muslims and we have Muslims committing violence. We said that that was to set up the issue, who's right here? And then we went to the sources to show who's right. Uh, so if you can show from the Christian sources that we're called to violence, please do so on Thursday. Now regarding the, the Meccan period, uh, they asked for the source on uh, Saad uh, shedding the first blood, that's Ibn Saq. He says that Hamza wasn't a Muslim yet. Uh, I read the passage to you. Uh, will you after he after he goes in and hits uh, he hits uh, Abu Jahl with his bow? He says, "Will you insult him, Muhammad, when I follow his religion?" That sounds like a Muslim to me. Uh, he says, "Muhammad uh, Muhammad said he would conquer uh, Arabia and Mecca. Therefore, he's a true prophet." Well, come on, Alexander the Great said he was going to conquer a lot too. That makes Alexander the Great uh, a prophet. No. It shows that Muhammad was set on conquering, even in the Meccan period when he was proclaiming that his religion is peaceful. Uh, regarding Muhammad surviving for 10 years, uh, he pointed out that Allah, uh, Abu Talib's tribe protected Muhammad. Abu Talib died in 619, and that, that's, when the, uh, that's when the people of Mecca picked up the persecution. But notice, 619, Muslims left in 622, Muhammad was still there. For three years, yes, they persecuted. Yes, there was killing. Yes, these things are bad. But again, my point was, this is absolutely nothing compared to what people endured under the Muslim rule. Um, regarding Ibn Asak, uh, I bring you slaughter. Uh, this is found in Ibn Asak and al tabari They say it's uh, fabricated. Notice, this is your earliest detailed biographical source that we have. I think al tabari is your best detailed biographical source that comes after Ibn Asad, they both grant this and they throw them out. Well, if you're throwing it, you're going to throw out these passages, guess what? By the time you get a century away from Muhammad, history has already been corrupted. How do Muslims know about Muhammad? They go to sources more than two centuries after the time of Muhammad. If, the time, if by the time you get to a century away from Muhammad, your sources have been corrupted, don't tell me you know anything about your prophet. So either treat your historians as reliable, or admit that you don't know a lot about Muhammad historically. Take your pick, I'll allow either one. Um, do you want to go on to? Sure, I'll mention how he, he briefly talked about uh, the Nafarid saying that uh, the Muslims were taking their property back. Um, please show me a source that says that. If, if you show me that, then I will, I will include that in my statements in the future. However, I don't think there is such a source. You do, even when you say that, even when you say the Muslims were just getting the talking back, guess what you have still conceded? You have still conceded that the Muslims initiated the attacks during the holy month, killing a person during that time. And if it's for property, then I think that's even worse. Then you talk about Badr, and you say, well, it was the, the Meccans who came and attacked, the Battle of Badr was the Meccans' fault. No, what happened in Badr was the, the Meccans realized, oh my goodness, these people are willing to attack during the holy month. Next time we send out a caravan, we're going to send a convoy with it to defend it. The Muslims came out for another raid. That's why there weren't so many Muslims there. There were only 313 Muslims uh, total for the Battle of Badr. They go out to attack this caravan. They see an entire army ready to fight in case they need to to defend this caravan. That's why That's why the Muslims in the Meccan army were not fighting near, near Medina. They were fighting out in the middle because the Muslims went out to meet them, and now you have a battle. That's what happened with the Battle of Badr. All right, uh, turning to the Quran on violence, uh, regarding fight those who do not believe, he doesn't seem to think that this is, is a call to any sort of violence, uh, universal violence against, uh, against people in general. Notice it says, uh, again, fight those who do not believe. Uh, notice what Ibn Kathir says about Muslims fighting everyone. Notice what Muhammad said in the Hadith about fighting people until they recite the Shahada. Uh, these aren't qualified in any way. Uh, notice, even in 929, it's until we pay the jizya. If you come up to me and try to preach Islam, am I going to start paying you the jizya? No. If you come up to me and say, I'd really like you to pay me the jizya, am I going to? No. The only way, I, the only way Christians and Jews would start paying off the Muslims is if the choice is death or if they're going to be fought. And that's exactly what we find when we turn to the hadith, when we turn to the, the, the life of Muhammad, and when we turn to the Quran, and when we turn to the commentators. Uh, 
He says, no one was forced to be a Muslim. Really, you guys have got to read some of your sources uh, after Muhammad took Mecca. Muhammad took Mecca, and Muslims point to this as a very peaceful instance in the life of Muhammad. He could have slaughtered everyone under the rules of warfare of that day. True. And he didn't. Only a, only a couple people were killed. So that, that seems very peaceful. What happened next? Well, a little later, Muhammad was returning, and he said he wanted to perform the Hajj, and he was upset because the pagans did. The pagans came there, and they would circle naked. So he issued he issued a command. After this year, no one, no one uh, who's a pagan gets to come here. And that's when you have Surah Surah nine five revealed. When the holy months are over, when these four, when this four month period is over, you guys have four months. You guys have four months to decide whether you want to be a Muslim or whether you want to leave. When four months are over, we are going to kill you. And there are no, there's no, there's no forced conversions. Lots of people converted because they were going to be killed and they didn't want to leave. That's just a fact of history. Also, in, in similar regards, after the Battle of Khaiba, a lot of the Jews, uh, I'm sorry, in, uh, after um, Asma bin Marwan was killed by uh, by order of Muhammad, a lot of the people came to Islam after that. Well, answer me this: Why would people all of a sudden come to Islam when they're seeing people getting killed? It says very clearly at that point, people came to Islam because they saw the power of Islam. Right there in the records. Uh, Surah uh, 328, he said, uh, regarding don't take uh, take people as uh, non-believers as friends and protectors, he says, well, you know, in Christianity, you have don't be yoked together with unbelievers. That's not what I'm talking about. He missed the point entirely. I was referring to the part where if, if they're more numerous than you, you pretend to be friendly towards them, you smile in their faces while you're cursing them in their hearts, and this is what you're supposed to do when you're in an area and you're outnumbered. And here in the West, we have Muslims telling us left and right, oh, we love you guys, we're so peaceful, we just want to get along. I know that some of you believe this, but I also know that you are commanded to faith. So I sometimes can't tell the difference, and that's scary. And, and I'll just say that my parents are Muslim, my relatives are Muslim, I'm not saying that they're trying to pretend to be friends with me. That they are friends with me, they love me. Uh, I'm not saying that everyone in the West is like that, that people nowadays practice these things. What we are saying is that the people who are commenting on the verse of the Quran said this is what Islam means. Um, he says that uh, uh, Christians are going to be, I mean, he says that Jews and Christians are left on their own as long as they're providing, uh, as long as they're paying the jizya. And he rejected the commentaries I gave. Uh, we have all sorts of things see, that, that, that refer to the Muslim attitude towards Jews and Christians. Sahih Muslim number 4366. Uh, it has been reported that the messenger said, I will expel the Jews and Christians from the Arabian Peninsula and will not leave any but Muslims. Is this a man who, invisi uh, who, who has a vision of, uh, of a peaceful society? Of a society where, where Christians and Jews and Muslims are all going to live in harmony? No, I will expel them all. I don't want to see them here. Uh, al Bukhari. Uh, number, uh, in, uh, number 1103 in his Aldaba uh, Al-Mufrad, uh, do not give, Muhammad said, do not give the people of the book the greeting first. Force them to the narrowest part of the road. So you get the main part of the road, then you force them to the narrow part of it. Uh, also in the same text, uh, Ibn Umar passed to the son of the Caliph Umar, passed by a Christian who greeted him. The Christian greets him. Uh, and Umar returned the greeting. He was told that the man was a Christian. When he learned that, he went back to him and said, Give me back my greeting. I'm not going to greet a, greet a Christian. Uh, and think about the Pact of Umar. We have this in al Tabari, we have this in uh, Ibn Hazm, we have this in all kinds of sources, the Pact of Umar. Uh, here are the rules that the Christians had to agree to. Uh, the Christians are forbidden to build churches or monasteries in their cities or nearby areas. They are not allowed to renovate such beings. They must allow any Muslim to lodge in these buildings in their churches for three nights and provide them with food. You have to feed the Muslims while they're there. They must not display any sign of their unbelief or forbid their relatives from converting freely to Islam. Furthermore, they must show reverence to Muslims and give them pride of place at their assemblies. Muslims get to sit up front. They are not allowed to use a saddle on a beast of burden, nor bear a sword, nor any other weapon. So right and bear back there. They are not to display a cross or any of their books as they are passing Muslims on their way. Now should Christians ever deviate from obeying these rules, Muslims would cease to honor the covenant that had protected them. In that case, Muslims can deal with them as if they have become a people of discord and trouble. As if we, have, if we break any of these rules, if we decide to fix our church when the roof is falling in, we are to be treated as mischief makers. And you know what the Quran says in 5 5-3 about mischief makers? Uh, the treatment that we are going to receive in the Bible already covered that. And one more passage uh, regarding uh, uh, Abdullah has pointed out that according to the Muslim sources, they are supposed, as long as dhimmis are following the rules, they are not supposed to harm us. That is true. Uh, but there's a reason for that. Uh, we have it from Muhammad himself. Uh, he said, 
I advise you, oh, this is from Omar. He said, I advise you to fulfill Allah's dhimma, financial obligation, made with the dhimmi, as it is the dhimma of your prophet and the source of livelihood for your dependents. You don't harm the dhimmis as long as they're following all the rules and not wearing their crosses and not rebuilding their churches and not preaching their religion. You don't harm them. Why? Because they're paying you 50% of what they get every year. Don't harm them. This is the religion of peace. Now, there are other things that he brought up. There just simply isn't much time in the, in the context of the debate. But he also talked about how I made a false parallel with martyrs. I said, oh, look, Muhammad praises martyrdom. How dare I say such a thing, praising martyrdom? No, I think having zeal for God is excellent. But the fact of the matter is, he says, there's nothing better than that. There's nothing better than dying in the cause of Allah. There's nothing better than fighting. Fighting in the forenoon or the afternoon is better than the whole world, whatever is in it. That's what I'm objecting to. There should be things better than fighting, namely love, peace. Uh, but this the greatest of these is love. Very good picture. Uh, just one more minute. Uh, regarding killing apostates, he says in the Old Testament there was a command to kill apostates. I agree. I would not call that a peaceful ruling. Christians aren't, aren't told to follow this, but I said, we said in the beginning, I'm not saying there's violence, therefore it's uh, not true. That's not what we said at all. We simply pointed out that this is a violent teaching. Uh, so there was violence in Old Testament Judaism, no doubt. In regards to hitting Aisha, he says that, oh, it was a tap. What is he talking about? In the Hadith itself, it says, He hit me in the chest, causing me pain. Read it for yourself, number 2127. I don't see how you can say that was a tap, unless you can really sense some skin. <laughs> All right, well, uh, our time is up. Uh, we've seen very clearly that Muslims are called over and over again in all their sources to violence. Uh, if this is this religion, is Muslim sources, we're not coming up with these things ourselves. We're referring to Islam to tell us these things for itself. You'll be ready to know it's time for a break. Um, 15 minutes, please, ladies and gentlemen, and come back for more. We have now the second rebuttal. If you could please return to your seats and quiet them down as well so we can hear the speakers. So, back, thank you. <laughs> Abdullah and Yaya are going to begin the set of rebuttals with an eight minute uh, period of rebuttals and then after that the other side will have an eight minute period as well and then we go to crossfire which I mentioned earlier, two minutes comment response time each and then we'll have a chance for you to answer, uh, ask questions, make comments um, and we'll come to that as well. So I'll hand over to Abdullah and Yaya for eight minutes please. Okay, uh, they brought the issue of um, abrogation again. Now, Ibn Kafir insists that this is that verse nine, uh, 29 is, is an abrogation. Firstly, Muslim scholars aren't agree on abrogation. Right? If you're going to say that, well, this guy believes in it, and that, but there are other guys who don't believe in it. In fact, there's, there's quite a lot of dispute about which, scholars, about which is abrogated, which is not. Uh, if that's your case, I can bring you Christian scholars that believe the Pope is infallible. Must you take that too? You know what I'm saying? Ibn Kafir is not the foremost authority. He like, it's an issue where people quote uh, certain scholars who, they, who say something that they think they, they like. They say this person is the greatest authority in the whole of, of uh, Islam. They said, no, it is not. There's, there's many other, uh, sometimes even better, better uh, commentators. So I don't believe it's abrogated, and even then, it's the, the Ibn Kathir has no different opinion in terms of the fifth, in terms of the understanding of this verse, than other Muslim interpreters or uh, scholars of fifth. When he says fight those who uh, disbelieve again, and he goes, see, when he says, uh, nor those who, who hold forbidden or others held forbidden, this is just something that comes after, just, uh, you know, saying out of those who disbelieve you are going to fight, just also, you know, the, those who hold forbidden or others has uh, not held forbidden. Why would the Quran mention this? If it's extraneous, if it's not, if it's not, uh, doesn't add any information to it, if we just want to fight disbeliever just because he's a disbeliever, why is that included? See, it's included because it's important to those who do not hold forbidden what God has held forbidden. And in the verse of Quran, uh, verse uh, 20, uh, sorry, 29, verse 46, it says, And dispute you not with the people who book, the Jews and Christians, except with means that are better, unless you see them inflicting wrong or doing injustice, which everyone will just say as. So, injustice, we intervene. Other than that, 
we don't intervene in that sense. Now, he also mentioned the fact that um, there, that in verse, was it Surah, was it Surah 532, it said that if you kill one person, you kill the rest of humanity, that was referring to the Jews. There is a virtual agreement among all scholars, all scholars who mean all interpreters, that this is an Islamic ethic. It's, it's mentioned in the Quran. Do you know why it's mentioned in the Quran? Why is it for the Jews and Christians? Just a story for us? No. It's for us to learn by what happens to the Jews and Christians. We, as Muslims, we're meant to learn what happened to the Jews and Christians. So when the Jews, when it said that this is something very important in the Jewish scripture, which said, if you kill one, you kill, it's like you kill everyone, this is a true, a truism. It is a statement that is universally true. And as, like it says in the New Testament, all scripture is good and can be used, as the Christians believe. Yeah? Same thing. All truisms which are universal can be used in Islam, and this is what all, almost all Muslims, all uh, the interpreters say. As he says, then he goes to Ibn. He mentions something from Ibn Hishak. Ibn Hishak says uh, concerning. Right, Ibn. Quotation Ibn Hishak. He goes, yeah. He said, if you're going to reject certain things in Ibn Hishak, you're going to reject everything. He doesn't understand what Ibn Hishak is. Yeah. Oh yeah, we'll cover it a bit more in the classified. Ibn Ishaq is a collection of history. In some of these collections, they are, the same story has four versions, written in the same, one after the other. The person who's a historian is collecting stories, collecting it. You have something? Oh, I write it down. You have something? I write it down. This was before they had uh, 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 formalized, it's not checking, they, they wrote down hadith as in, in a formal form, and, it was, and that is preserved. Obviously, the Mutawat of Imam Malik is a, is a formalized hadith book, and it's very early in Islam. For example, but they had formalized checking of narrators. You see, and the contention is is the contention of being sharp is in a way sometimes the same as our contention with the gospel. See, the, some of the gospels don't have we don't know from where it, from where the church got it from. You know, it has a name according to Luke, Matthew, Mark, whatever. We don't know who said it. Where, who are the chain narrators? We don't know. So in this situation, when we encounter the same situation in uh, Ibn Ishaq, we say that a particular narration has no chain to it, no, no traceable chain of narrations, we reject it outright and say it has no legal value. But it's going to be in the same book because the guy is trying to find a history from any source he can find. So again, you should actually understand this before you, you uh, use uh, this fallacy against us. Um, it, the Prophet Muhammad had a problem against some four against pagans. Whoa, 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 what prophet never fought against pagans? <laughs> It's what you do if you're a prophet, really. It seems to be fine as pagans. The case is that idolaters and polytheists. The Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu he said, uh, he was given commands that the Arabian Peninsula was going to be made holy. It was going to be made for only people who believed in God. And so the, the pagans, no idolaters, were allowed to, to live in uh, Arabia. Because this Ara God has made Arabia to be only for people who are of the one, believe in one God. So again, that's not a problem. But that's only if you believe if God sent it or not. So, uh, God's in Islam or not, but it's not a problem biblically. Biblically, it's not a problem. It should be a problem. As for the uh, oppression of the Quraysh, he said that, that there was, when after Abu Talib, the uncle of the Prophet, died, then the, the Quraysh oppressed, uh, didn't oppress it or kill the Prophet Muhammad. So the Prophet Muhammad wasn't stoned in Taif, the Prophet Muhammad wasn't boycotted to the point of starvation with, with his tribe and, and, and left in, in a valley, a desert valley somewhere. This didn't happen. Right? And, and they, didn't, they, they didn't plan to actually assassinate him uh, after this point. It didn't happen, right? See, wrong, it happened. Again, if you knew history, you'd see there was oppression. There was the, the, the pressure, they, they tried to kill him. Then he said that in, in the Battle of Haybar, the, the, the city, the Jewish city, they saw the power of Islam. This was that they were military for, forced to be Muslim or what have you. You saw the power of Islam. But if Islam, if and the Muslim army has been successful uh, in your region, you've seen the power of the, of, of the army. Let's say I've seen the power of the American army when it's going to certain countries around the world. Right? It's, if the problem is when you start killing innocent civilians, then I start having a problem with the American military. And then I think they've gone beyond their, their power, which is, a, which is the, the issue. And it doesn't say that the, the Muslims killed innocent civilians. It doesn't say that. Again, you need to see that innocent civilians uh, were killed. So the issue that um, we have to be, pretend to be peaceful. Yes, you know, the, the Muslims, we, there are certain times where we lie. Yes, I'm going to admit this. We, we have to lie. But we're not have to. We can lie if our life is threatened. If they say, put a gun to our head, say, pray this idol or we shoot you. We have the option to. God, meaning God will punish you if you do, if you actually say, right, fine, uh, I'll do that. All right? He won't punish you. So are you planning to force Muslims to convert to Christianity at the point of gun or force us to leave Islam? Because if, if, if not, then there shouldn't be a concern for you whether we actually lie for life as friends. In this country like this, 
usually we're not afraid of our life, so there's no need to lie. So why are you bring it up for? As for as for the issue of uh, yes, he called the son of Omar and how he treated a, a, a Christian uh, and so on. Sorry, thank you. Son of Omar, he's not source for us. Uh, so uh, all the other there are other sources that say Jews Christian achieve respect. Um, first one of them says that Christians will have to wear big crosses, then they will, and another no, no one said they have to wear no crosses, make your mind up. Um, and the Pact of Omar, there are two Pacts of Omar. One is a, fel- uh, is a forgery, and that's the one they were quoting. The other one has historically been proven to be true, and that allows Christians the right and freedom to have their churches and build them. I can quote it here, but there's no time. Um, the uh, Posse Law, Posse is a mistranslation, it really should be the treason law. And essentially anyone who, who does not want to act according to, to, to the, the laws of the state and believe that people should be killed or fought, they should, these people are to be um, uh, judged for it. And of course, the case of Asma, there is a narration here, which you just will bring it up, which said that she was inciting uh, violence against Prophet Muhammad If you incite violence in any country, you're going to get locked up. And um, Abu Dhul has the Quraysh saying, to the people of Medina who are pagans, some of the pagans are saying, if you, do, if you do not expel the Muslims who come, who come uh, amongst you, we will fight you and kill you, kill, kill your, your, fight, your men and capture women if you don't expel the Muslims. So the Quraysh were already being aggressive to Medina and, and urging warfare. And uh, that's it comes to the time. Thank you very Thank much. You. Now we have an, an eight minutes rebuttal from the Christian side. <coughs> All right, I'd like to first mention that um, he started off by talking about abrogation. He says, not all Muslim scholars are agreed upon the application of these facts. Mind you, Ibn Kathir is not just one scholar that we're picking up randomly. We go to Muslims and we ask them, look, it seems like whoever we quote, you just throw them out the window. You say, I don't agree with that one, I don't agree with this one. So he said, please tell us who we should go to and who do you consider trustworthy? They always respond, well, Ibn Kathir to us. And, is the most and then we go to Ibn Kathir and they say, who's he? We don't care about him. Interesting stuff. But the fact of the matter is, this is not just one person we're quoting. Oh, you're quoting a scholar. Well, the other scholars disagree. That's what he says. But I understand what we're saying. This scholar agrees with multiple other tafsirs, who also agrees with Sira literature, who also agrees with the Ahadith, who also agrees with the Quran. This scholar has the, the explanation that fits best into the picture, and that's why we go with him. This is being ignored. He's making it sound like we're just picking one scholar over any other scholar. He refers back to 929 of the Quran, which says, um, you know, fight the people from among the people of what they feel they think Jesus feel and Smith feel themselves to do. He refers to that as if it's just some group of people who you fight because of some random beliefs. No, the fact of the matter is it says right after that, in 930, the curse of God is upon them because they believe certain people are the sons of God. That is why they are cursed, and that is why the Ahadith commentators, why the Quran commentators, the CSA, they should be fought. He keeps ignoring this fact. It's right there, Surah 9, verse 30. He then says, look at 532. 532 says, you save one person, it's as if you save everyone. You kill one person, it's as if you kill everyone. He says, this is something we learned from the past, which we're all supposed to uphold as universal truth. We need to understand that things that were said to the Jews can still apply to us. Well, there's also something called abrogation where things that did apply in the past no longer apply anymore, they are not universal truth. So the question is, does this count as universal truth, or was it abrogated? And I'm telling you, by the verse of the Quran and the way Muhammad lived his life, we see repeatedly that it was abrogated. If not, then I ask you, when Muhammad slew a person, did he slay slay the whole of mankind? You're saying apply it as if it's universal truth. Muhammad killed, uh, he sent for the, the killing of Abu Afaq. He sent for the killing of Asma bin Marwan. He sent for the killing of Kinana. Each time he did these things, was he fighting people who fought against him? No. He's fighting people who merely said words or were trying to defend their own property. And so did Muhammad kill mankind three times over? According to him, yes. Uh, and I'll just point out, if you, if you want to say that that command goes uh, for everyone, that's fine. We go to your commentators, this refers to innocent people. According to Islam, if you reject Muhammad and you deny uh, Allah and you, uh, you uh, say that Jesus is Lord, you do any of those things, you are not an innocent person. You don't fit into that category. And that's why Muslims could be called the fightest in Surah 929. Uh, regarding the history of Muhammad, he says, Ibn Asak, we don't know what Ibn Asak is, it's a collection, some stories are contained in four, four versions. 
Um, this was before it's not uh, checking had been formalized. All of that's true. The bottom line remains it's your earliest source. It's more than a century earlier than your great collections of ahadith. If history had been so corrupted that a great historian writing a century, a little over a century after the events can't get it right, even though he's going around checking, uh, if he can't get it right, then why should I believe that your historians more, more than a century after that could get it right? Again, you have a choice. Either say that your early historians are basically reliable, true, not perfect, but basically reliable in general, or say that you just don't know anything about Muhammad. Now, if you, uh, um, regarding sources like um, uh, uh, Muhammad saying that he brings uh, slaughter to the people of Mecca. Uh, we have the Isnad right here, so true. Uh, Ibn Ishaq didn't always record his Isnads, but he did on this one. There are only four names on the list. That's a, that's a pretty short chain. So, uh, and I'm looking at this, and these were other collectors of Syria literature, so this seems uh, reliable. Uh, regarding the, the idea that there was an oppression in Mecca, that Muslims were oppressed, yes. We have instances of Muslims being killed. We have instances of Muslims being tortured. We have instances of people being very mean to Muhammad. We're not questioning that. We have not objected to that. We simply point out the fact that Muslims look to that and say, how horrible, this is awful. Look at this violence, This look at this persecution. Why don't you say the exact same thing when Muhammad, when Muhammad does something much, much worse to the Jews? When they criticize, I mean, think about this. Muhammad is going out forming an alliance against the people of Mecca. The people of Mecca aren't supposed to do anything in retaliation. When the Jews of Medina attempted to form an alliance against Muhammad, what happened? All the men slaughtered, everyone who reached puberty slaughtered, women taken into captivity, uh, children sold as slaves. And this is perfectly acceptable. Hello? Uh, and we could go on to the other events, to what happened in Mecca. Uh, convert within four months, or leave, or you'll be killed. Uh, why the inconsistency? Why is it perfectly acceptable to do what you want to the Jews or to the pagans? But if you even if you even criticize Muhammad, you deserve death. And this makes perfect sense to Muslims. And I, I'd just like to see uh, a bit of consistency on this one. And when speaking of Jews, uh, to understand the Battle of Khaiba was one where people who had been forced out of Medina had fled to Khaiba. Um, a whole group of people had fled to Khaiba. And there, these people are just working out in the fields. According to the sources, they're just going with their shovels to start a day's work when the Muslims descend upon them and start killing the men. So he's saying, well, we're, we're not talking about killing innocents. How do you find innocent? How do you define innocent? If you're saying people who are unarmed, who are forced out of their own city, are not innocent, I don't know who is. And none of us here are innocent under those standards, except the good Muslims here. So I think we've thoroughly responded to what he just said in his second rebuttal, but he has not responded to everything we said in our first rebuttal. Don't forget, in Sahih Bukhari now, those of you who, uh, who follow the Hadith, uh, the way most Muslims do will understand that Sahih Bukhari is the most authentic book of Ahadith, uh, the top Sahih said that, and in that, Muhammad says, I have been commanded to fight until the people say, La ilaha illallah. He didn't respond to that. Then he also says things along the lines that there's not anything that is greater than jihad in this entire world. He doesn't respond to that. Shouldn't peace be greater then? If, if Islam is a religion of peace, shouldn't that be what Muhammad said? We, I, I, let, me, let me also quote Ibn Majah, also considered part of Sayyid Sitta. He says, uh, in number 2763 of Ibn Majah, it says, It was narrated from Abu Huraira, the messenger of Allah said, Whoever meets Allah with no mark on him as a result of fighting, he will meet him with a deficiency. According to Ibn Majah, if you don't come to Allah with battle wounds, you are deficient in your faith. That's how central fighting is to Islam. Now, now think about this. Uh, we've been presenting our cases. We look to one of the last surahs revealed, Muhammad's final marching orders. Fight those who do not believe. That is a very clear statement. We turn to Islam's greatest commentator. What does he say? All people of the world must be called to Islam. If any one of them refuses to do so, they should be fought till they are killed. That agrees with us. We turn to uh, uh, Al-Bukhari. We turn to Sahih Muslim. I am called to fight people until they recite the Shahada. We look at Ibn Ishaq, the history of Muhammad. Everything in this debate agrees with our position, not with Abdullah and Yahya. And I hate to do this again, but I have to end up with talking about women. Because the first time I talked about women, many people in the audience shook their heads as if I was trying to say something evil. But the fact of the matter is, in Islam we know, chapter 4, verse 34, came down when the man had slapped his wife so hard that he left a handprint on her face. She comes to Muhammad and she says, this is what just happened to me. Muhammad says, I would I would rule in your favor, but I just received this verse from Allah saying, don't, uh, you can be, wives can be beaten. Not only that, uh, Abu uh, Bakr struck Aisha violently when she held up the army of Muhammad. 
In Abu Dawud, number 2142, it is said, a man will not be asked as to why he beat his wife. In fact, Omar, thank you, the Khalifa of Islam, was going to beat his wife, according to Ibn Majah, 1986. He went, went to beat his wife, a man stops him, and Omar says, I tell you by Allah, no man is going to be asked why he's being able to be allowed to beat his wife. Thank you very much. Thank you, all of you, for that.